uh, thank God and, um, and, and certainly thank our, our worship leaders and our musicians and, and you all this morning, because I think we, we, we tested the structural integrity of this building this morning. Um, there are some, some voices just raised up in praise, so I appreciate, appreciate that. I know our, I know our God did. Uh, I want to begin this morning, just uh, I want to thank uh, Brother Scott, he's not here this morning, but I wanted to thank him for stepping in and filling in for me when I was gone last week. Um, I was confident, I, I got a chance to listen back to the podcast um, uh, last week sometime, and, and I, I, I know as he started, he, he's, he, he, were, he was, had forgotten, I guess, that it was that Sunday that he was supposed to, to share, and uh, was kind of, he said he felt like he was a bit disjointed and, and stuff as, as we talked back and forth, but I, I know that uh, God gave him exactly what he was supposed to share and what you were supposed to hear. And so I'm, I'm grateful for, uh, for folks stepping in and, and delivering God's word. This morning, um, if you have your Bibles, you can actually head over to 1 Samuel 17 if you want to. Um, but we're going to jump back into our series, Like a Child. And, and we started this a few weeks ago. And if you remember, we started this series... And I'm not sure if there's going to be more to the series than just this story, but we may just camp here for a while. But we started looking at the childhood story of David and Goliath. And, and I thought, before we get too far down the road, anybody remember anything about this story at all? Like the guy's name was David, the other guy's was Goliath, that's awesome. We're off to a good start. Remember anything else besides that, besides their names? Yeah, yeah, 40 days they stood across this valley just shaking in their sandals or boots, whatever they happen to have on, um, at the sight of this Goliath, of this giant, and, and David kind of steps in and, and, and kind of says, you know, what's your problem in a sense? Um, anything, you remember anything else about the story? Goliath was from Gath, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The Israelites were fighting a giant that had Joshua taken care of things 300 years earlier, they wouldn't have been fighting. Um, Unfortunately, the work to get rid of the giants in Gath, in the city of Gath, was a lot of extra work, and Joshua didn't do the extra work to fight that giant. So 300 years later, they're still fighting the same giants. Not these same giants, but that lineage, that family. And and we talked a little bit about that, that, hey, if you don't deal with your giants, you're going to leave them for somebody else to deal with. A lot of times, it's your family. It's your kids, or it's your grandkids, or it's people that you love or you care about that end up having to deal with your stuff because we wouldn't do the hard work and deal with it ourselves. So great. Anybody else? Anything? Remember anything else? Um, uh, that Goliath was at, at least Goliath was constantly Yeah, every day, morning and night, forty days. He just came out and just called them out. Right? He'd yell at them and and kind of mock them. And, and more than anything, mock God. Um, and sometimes we, can, we need to remember that as, as children of God. Sometimes when you, get, when you get pushed up against or persecuted because of your faith or, or things like that, understand in a sense, don't take it personal. Because who they're talking about is your God. And, and David took offense to that. And, and we should too. That when somebody mocks your faith, in a sense they're mocking your God. That should be a little bit offensive. We shouldn't be, we shouldn't be offensive in our response but it should offend us to, to a point that we want them to help understand who God really is and let them come into relationship with him. So good job, you guys. Great job reminding, uh, remembering what was going on. Um, we, spent, we spent some time a few weeks back understanding the importance of identifying our giants. One of the things that, that God does for us right away in 1 Samuel 17 is he names the giant. And we talked about how, that import, how important that is in our lives, that you know and you name your giants. Um, a lot of times... Uh, if you're like me, and, and, and I think we're all pretty human and we have a lot of similarities in some ways, we tend to try to avoid our giants. You know, I, I may know what it is, but I don't want to face it. I don't want to deal with it. I want to pretend like it's not there and somehow figure out that it'll, you know, pretend that it'll go away by itself. It won't. It never does. Um, and so we, we looked at the story of how David had to confront this giant and, and how we're kind of given that same example and that same mandate to, to have the courage to, to stand up and to face the giants that, that are in our lives. And we identified that seeing the giants and, and, and seeing for what they really are and the damage that they're doing in our lives is important. But the other thing that we talked about is that cannot be the only thing we see. We should not focus only on the giants. They should not capture all of our attention. I came across the story several years ago, and it, it just seemed like it fit here this morning, so I want to share with you. Um, it seems a golfer... Uh, had been taking lessons for several weeks and had seen his game really improving. And he was out on the course one day, and he hits an errant shot into some trees. 
And so he goes over to, to hit the shot, and, and his instructor was with him. And as the instructor watched this, his pupil uh, kind of stand over the ball and look, he could tell that the guy was just growing frustrated and, and, and that his, his confidence was just beginning to wane. And so the instructor comes over and approaches him and says, well, what do you see? And, 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 and the guy, you know, getting ready to hit the ball says, well, I see a bunch of trees. He says, well, that's the problem then. He says, all you're looking at is the trees, and you're not spotting the opening and the opportunity that lies beyond them. That's our problem, <laughs> oftentimes. In the middle of our storms, in the middle of facing our giants and our, our difficulties and our challenges, a lot of times we don't look beyond the giant and the difficulty and the storm to see the opening and spot the opportunity beyond it. This morning, I don't know where you're at and, and, and what's kind of weighing on you, but I, I have to believe we're human. And so you may have walked in this morning with a lot of giants just kind of clinging to you or calling you out still. Um, maybe you walked in this morning with you're just dealing with just a lot of stress and you're, you're ready to just kind of like throw in the towel. Or, or maybe there's, there's some situations in relationships or finances or health or whatever it is that's just tends to just be, you know, discouraging you and, and, and pulling you down. Maybe there's dysfunction or some damage at some level in your life. And, and the reality is those giants are there. And, and it doesn't do good. One of the things I, I think church, sometimes we, we, we do a disservice for each other is we come into church sometimes on Sunday mornings, and, and for a little bit we almost kind of act like this is our reprieve and we don't have to think about those things at all. And I'm convinced just the opposite. Don't leave that stuff outside. Bring it in with you. It's a part of what you're dragging through the week anyway. Bring it on in. But then let's do something with it. That's why we're here. That's why we huddle together. It's to deal with our stuff because there's people outside of this building. There's people in our community that need to know Jesus Christ. They don't need to know all of our difficulties and challenges. And we, if we can deal with those and we can encourage each other here, that's why we come together. Um, and, and so this morning, if you walked in with some stuff just clinging to you, I want you to know that Jesus, if you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior this morning, you have a heavenly Father that says he has plans for you. He has plans for you. And, and, and Brother Scott reminded you last week that those are plans for your welfare, not for your disaster, not for your discouragement, not for you to be dominated by. That you have a Father who has plans for your welfare to give you a future and a hope. I, I've read that verse over and over again in, in it reminds me that what God is trying to tell us is that your present situation is not your final destination. A lot of times we get, we get into that mindset that where I'm at, where I'm stuck, what I'm feel, dealing with, I'm going to deal with forever. You will not deal with it forever. It, it's kind of it's perspective. And we're going to talk about that in a few weeks, about perspective, because one of my favorite books in the Bible is the book of Job. And, 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 and it's a long book, but it's a book about perspective. We're going to talk about that. But one of the things that God wants us to constantly get is some perspective. You do not have to be dominated by your giants. Matter of fact, that's why we're in this story. David shows us how to deal with them. You know how he dealt with his giant? He faced God first. He faced God first. I want you to be reminded two weeks ago, I thought this was an awesome quote. We're going to, a couple of quotes from Max Lucado this morning, but one of them, I thought this was awesome. He shared this. He said, focus on giants, you stumble. Focus on God, your giants tumble. And that's so true. It's so true. You, you, you guys know how it is. I, it's one of those things that the more that giant just shows up and it, and it, it appears before you, it just looks so much bigger. And it just kind of gets all of your attention and your energy and, and everything's kind of poured into it. And, and if we could just turn and just face God for a moment and recognize how big he is in comparison to how big that struggle or that giant or that difficulty is, I think we gain some perspective. So this morning, if you're in 1 Samuel 17... I want us to learn something, because here's the thing that I, I'm a big believer. I, I don't, I'm, I'm not a big fan of non-practical, non-applicable lessons in teaching. I don't think it does us any good to have this incredibly you know, profound doctrinal conversation that you can't, it doesn't have any handles on it. You can't grab it and put it to work tomorrow. And, and so we're, we're talking about, hey, you know, know your giant, you know, name your giant. We're talking about know your God. Let God's name be lifted up. But the question I constantly come to when I, when I look at these lessons and I, I look at David's life and, and I think about these things is the question, how? How do I do that? How do I, how do I face this giant and how do I ultimately, through God's grace and with his strength, how do we defeat it? And I, I hope we're going to begin answering the question, how, this morning. Because I want you to walk out tonight or today and, 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 and walk into next week with something you can get a hold of and say, you know what, I, don't, I may not know all the steps, but I've got this one. 
and I'm going to work on this one this week. With, through God's grace and with his help, I'm going to work on this one. And so this morning, I, I hope that we give you at least one thing to grab a hold of um, and, and for you to, to put into practice as you face your giants this week. So 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 40 is, is where we're going to start up. And I know it's kind of like right in the middle of the story, but um, I want us to see some stuff here. 1 Samuel 17, 40 says, instead, now, I don't know what your version may say, that this is um, HCSB, but nonetheless, instead tells us that there was something that happened previously. And if you backed up a few verses previously, you'd find out that King Saul, this big guy that was head and shoulders above everybody else as far as height, had put all of his armor on David. Remember the story? David's like, I'm going to go fight him. And Saul's like, no, probably not a good idea. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to go get him. He's like, well, if you're going to go get him, here, put this on. And he puts his armor on. David's probably 15, we, we, we guesstimate, roughly, age-wise. He's probably 15 years old. So this guy, Saul, who's a full-grown man and actually taller than everybody else, that's kind of why they made him king, um, probably not a good criteria, just, I'm just letting people know. Um, if, if you pick people based on their height, unless they're basketball, unless you're doing like fantasy basketball, um, probably not a good idea. Um, that, that you, well, let's make him the king. He's big. Um, Saul was big in stature, but as he went through his life, he was little in character. And, and that, became a diff, that became a problem for not only Saul, but the entire nation of Israel. It became a serious problem for David. Um, but so he, this big guy puts all of his armor on David, and it says David tried to walk with this stuff on, and he couldn't. Instead, here we are, verse 40, he, David, took his staff in his hand and chose five, small, or five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the pouch in his shepherd's bag. Then with, with a sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Now, this morning, I want you to know there's some really, really great stuff for us to unpack in this verse, and we're going to take some time here. But before we get into, like, the meat of the verse, I want us to see a couple of things here real quick that's, that's important for us. First, I want you to notice that while David had complete faith in God, and he did, I mean, he talked about, you know, God's going to deliver me. God's going to whip, you know, Goliath's booty, and, and, and we're going to all rejoice about it. I mean, he has this incredible faith in God. He still actively arms himself. He has all this faith in God, yet he still picks up a staff, and he picks up a sling, and he's got a shepherd's bag, and he's got a pouch. So he has all of this faith in God, yet he still actively arms himself. He recognizes that while this battle is God's, he also recognizes his responsibility as a soldier of the Lord to equip himself. And I think sometimes this is such an important lesson for us as Christians, because sometimes we get weird on faith that, well, God's just going to take care of it all. There's a lot of things that God says, hey, you know what? There's a, there's a scripture in the King James Version. I don't know what it says other than that. That's what I grew up on. It says, quit ye like men. In other words, it says, stand up, put your big boy pants on, act like a man. And, and, and some of the women are like, well, cool, I'm out of this. It's, it's actually for all of us. It's, all, it's for all of us to kind of stand up and, and do what you can do, trusting that God will do what only he can do. There, there's nowhere in God's word where it says, hey, just lay down and I'll just take care of it all. He says, hey, if nothing else, pray earnestly, pray diligently, prepare earnestly, prepare diligently. This is awesome because we'll see the same idea kind of resonate through the, through the New Testament. Matter of fact, Paul says it very directly in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. He says, put on the full armor of God. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the tactics of the devil. While God is big, and God is going to battle for us, and God is certainly on our side, and if we're on his side, we're on the majority side, we're, we're on the winning side, he still asks us to participate. He still asks us to be a part of what's happening. David understood that. He's like, God's got this, but I'm taking my staff, and I've got my sling, and we're going to just watch what God does. Let me assure you, it, it looks like David shook off the armor of Saul. David was outfitted perfectly spiritually. He had everything he needed spiritually. He took all that other stuff off, but he had exactly what he needed spiritually. So first, we need to be actively armed. That's part of what we do on Sunday mornings, is we help equip each other and prepare and get actively armed for the stuff that's going to come through your week, because you will have stuff come through your week. Matter of fact, you may have stuff you're wrestling with right now as I'm talking, because you're thinking about that. That's all right. We want to come together. I want you to be armed. I want you to be equipped. I want you to be ready to do battle, because it's going to happen. I want you to be part of that, prepared for it. And that's the next step. David, David's pre-battle preparation was intentional. He prepared intentionally. Verse 40 tells us that David chose five small stones. He didn't go into battle with some like random 
you know, act. He didn't kind of just like, all right, I don't know what I'm doing, but let's just fight. It's not what he did. He, he actively, he, in, he intentionally prepared. He didn't grab any old rocks. He deliberately chose five rocks, five stones. They were weapons he could get his hand on. They were weapons that he could use. And, and unfortunately, here's what my history has been, and maybe this resonates with you a little bit. You get into a bind and you get into a pinch and you start getting desperate. And you start trying anything and everything to try to battle through whatever that, that, that circumstance or that giant is. I want you to understand, David wasn't desperate. What he did was intentional. It was very measured. It was very, it was very intentional in what he was doing. And too often we, we try to take on our giants using some arbitrary or desperate or unproven strategy. It's like, well, I'm just going to, I don't know, I'll just fake it till I make it. You've heard that said? Not a good strategy. Not a good strategy at all. The Hebrew word actually for chose is a really cool word. The word is bakar. And it means tried and accepted. So sometimes we look at like David went to battle. Oh, he just grabbed up some rocks. No, 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 no. I think David took some time there at the brook and kind of picked a rock up, felt it, weighed it, tossed it aside if it wasn't going to suit his purpose. He, he purposely, intentionally chose and prepared for battle. I want you to understand that we need to be active and intentional in our preparation to face our giants. And, and let me share with you, sometimes, you guys, here's, here's the thing that I do, and, and, and there again, I'm sharing a lot of my stuff, and I'm just hoping maybe it connects with you at some point. A lot of times, we, don't, we, we fail to prepare until we're in the middle of the battle, and then all of a sudden, we're scrambling for some armor. David grabbed this stuff up and prepared before he ever stepped up to confront Goliath. This was happening on the way, and I think sometimes we forget about that, that preparation is prepare, beforehand. Get ready ahead of time so that you're not scrambling and desperate in the middle of it. And too many times, that's when we struggle. That's when the wind and the waves get so big is because we forget we failed to prepare adequately beforehand. One of my favorite books of the Bible is the book of Daniel, and, and I love how it starts out that, that these, these little kids, and, and they really are, they're like 12 years old, they get kind of kidnapped, basically, from, from Judah, and they go into, into captivity in Babylon, and, and all of a sudden, they're in this new culture, in this new land, and the king says, hey, you guys are pretty strong, and I want you to serve in my court. Here, eat some meat. And you know, one of my favorite verses in scripture is in Daniel, the first chapter, where it says that they had purposed in their heart not to defile themselves with the king's meat. You know why I love that? They made a decision well in advance of ever being tempted of how they would respond. Let me share with you, the same application is for us in our struggles with the giants. Be purposeful. Be intentional. Prepare well beforehand. Because if you're not facing a giant right now, you might tomorrow. What are you doing to prepare? What are you doing to get ready? If you're like me, sometimes we don't. And we find ourselves in the middle and we're like, oh, God, what do we do? And he's like, you prepare. You prepare. You prepare. Now i got to rescue you because you, you didn't prepare. Don't go into battle armed only with your strength. Put on the armor that God supplies. David was armed. He was armed to the hilt. Whether we recognize it or not, he was spiritually armed to the hilt. Secondly, don't, fight, don't try to fight your giants with your own strategy. Use the tried, tested, proven strategies of God. Your strategies will fail. Your, fat, your strategies will fail. So this morning, I want us to do what David did. David picked up five stones. He made five crucial decisions when he went out to face Goliath. And this morning, I, I want us to begin picking up five stones that we need in order to face and take down our own giants. This is the how part. This is the practical. The other start was like, hey, you know, know your giant, name your giant, know your God, let your God's name be lifted up. All that stuff is kind of like, hey, that's what we want to ultimately accomplish. But we're back here at point A, and we're talking about Z, and how do we get there? I want to give you the how this morning. I want to give you something you can wrap your hand around. Before we pick up our first stone, I want you to watch this clip, and I want you to listen to what this coach says before his team goes out to face the giants. About five minutes, we head out for the warm up. I want to say two things. Number one, I love you and I'm proud of you. I wouldn't trade the season for anything in the world. Secondly, you're about to play the biggest team you've ever faced. 
They're strong, fast, and undefeated. So far. But I want you to remember where God has brought us. I want you to remember how hard you've worked. We weren't supposed to have a winning season, but we do. We weren't supposed to advance through the playoffs, but we did. We're not supposed to be here, but we are. So if there's anything in you that says this is a losing effort, throw it out. Because as I stand here, I believe that as long as we honor God, nothing is impossible. Nothing. Leave everything out on the field. Give your best to God tonight. And whether we leave the field the victors or not, we will give God the glory. Now, who will go fight the Giants with me? that he didn't stand there and make a bunch of excuses and say well I don't know guys they're really big and they're really talented and and they're undefeated and and what it did that challenge jogged his memory and 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 that's exactly what happened with David while everyone else trembled David remembered and this morning for just a few minutes I want to talk to you about the first stone that you have to pick up if you're ever going to conquer face your giants and be successful and that's the stone of the past I want us to read a little bit. If you're still in 1 Samuel 17, we're going to read a little bit here. Verse 34 says, David answered Saul. Uh, now, there again, he's kind of, we're kind of jumping in the middle. You kind of back up a verse, and it says that Saul basically told David, you're a youth, and that guy has been a warrior since his youth. And so David answers Saul's kind of discouraging words. Saul kind of says, you can't do this. This guy is undefeated. He's been a warrior for longer than you've been alive. And David answers Saul. He says, your servant has been tending his father's sheep. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden the comparison seems to me to fall apart. It's like we're talking about battle and you're talking about sheep tending and sheep herding. This doesn't make sense. He says, whenever a lion or a bear came and carried off a lamb from the flock, I went after it, struck it down, and rescued the lamb from its mouth. If it reared up against me, I would grab it by its fur. I love that phrase. I love that. Because I think sometimes as Christians, that's the part we don't get to. We don't grab it by its fur and say, you know what, God? In your strength, by your grace, with your mercy, we're going to battle this thing. We're going to win this thing. He says, I grab it by its fur. I, I, I have these weird images that play in my mind as I, as I see like, this teenage kid just grabbing this lion like, Ugh! and like, just starts beating up on it. Strikes it down, and he says, and I kill it. Your servant has killed lions and bears. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And I I shared with you a a quote earlier from Max Lucado in a book that he wrote several years back called Facing Your Giants. He writes this phrase. I thought it was a good one. A good memory makes heroes. A bad memory makes wimps. How often do we face our giants and allow ourselves to be reminded of God's victories? How often do you do that? When you're up against whatever it is that causes you that, that ridiculous amount of stress or, or causes you to just be frozen by fear or whatever it is that you come up against, how many times do we face those things and allow ourselves to be reminded of God's victories in the past? Most of the time, we're a lot like those soldiers were that Paul told us about, the Israelites that stood frozen for 40 days just kind of afraid to move. And, and they spent a lot of time kind of measuring Goliath's height and weighing his weapons, and gave all the excuses in the world for why they could not be victorious. The problem was that they forgot one small item, big item. God was with them. God was with them. And we stand often frozen by fear, thinking more about our giants than about our God, and we focus more on our troubles than God's track record. Did you know God has a perfect track record? Hasn't lost a battle yet, won't ever. If we're, we should do fantasy football, I want him on my team. And you can have everybody else. I want him. I want to be on his team. You ever been there, just staring at your troubles and kind of freaking out about it because you don't know how it's going to go? 
or how it's going to end, or when it'll end, or if it'll, you ever been there? I've been there not too long ago. A little over a year ago, um, Carrie got news that she was officially laid off. And we, um, all of a sudden, it was like financial giant. Whoa, okay, God. And, and you know, I don't know about you husbands, the rest of you guys, you know how, how we do sometimes, though. Um, you don't let your wife know how stressed you are about it. You just kind of go, okay, we'll be fine. And then you're separate for a few minutes. You're like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> you like start, like, what is going on? How are we going to do this? And I remember one night, I couldn't sleep at all. Went downstairs, and I just stretched out on the ground before God and said, why are you doing this? Why are you bringing, down, bringing us down a road you know we're not ready for? And you know what God did? In a still small voice, and I'm, I'm not saying he spoke audibly because that would be weird and I'd be counseling. He, didn't, he like didn't talk out loud to me, but his spirit prompted me to just remember some lion and bear-sized conquests before. He reminded me that, hey, you know what? Last year, I, f- I figured out a way to allow Carrie to finish all of her schooling while working here and there, meeting all of your needs and actually giving you some of your wants. Need I remind you again how big I am? We get so good at staring at trouble and forgetting our God's perfect track record. What I'm trying to get you to understand is, you know, look at your giant. Don't deny that your giant's there, but then remember your God. First Chronicles 16, verse 12 says this. It says, remember the wonderful works which the Lord has done. That's a great verse. You know what's interesting? Nowhere in all of Scripture does God ever tell us to make a list of all of our past defeats. Nowhere in Scripture do you say, hey, by the way, you, you need, why don't you start listing all the things you've failed in? What he does over and over again is reminds us to catalog all of his victories. He says, be reminded of that. Remember this. Matter of fact, one of the coolest things, one of the coolest like, passages of Scripture is in the book of Joshua. Do you remember what happened in Joshua? Uh, if you remember the story, like children of Israel, remember, I'll just give you the like, Reader's Digest version real quick. Um, they get to the edge of the promised land. First time, they didn't have the faith. They didn't trust God to take them over and possess it. So God says, hey, take a lap. It's going to last like 40 years. And, and, like, and half of you are going to die. And the other half that are younger that might kind of get this, we're going to give them another shot. And so they bring this younger group to the edge of the, of the, of the Jordan River and says, hey, um, you guys ready to do this this time? Or, or are we going to run another lap? What do you want to do? And they're like, let's do this. And so God takes them across the Jordan River. He tells the priests, hey, step in. And once you step in, I love this because this is so practical for us. Once you step in, then I will hold back the water. Let that help you with your theology a little bit. Because sometimes we, we get this idea, well, God, just open up the door for me. And he says, you need to ask and you need to seek and you need to knock. You need to step and then watch what I do based on your faith in me. And sometimes we get that backed up. We want God to just kind of answer all the questions and give us all the solutions before we ever do anything that shows we trust him. So in this case, he says, trust me? Yeah, he says, step in. They step in, the waters hold back. Do you you remember what happened after that? They walked across dry land, right? These little, these kids that are now like 40 that, you know, had walked across that, well, maybe they're like older than 40 now, had walked across the Red Sea. All of a sudden it was like deja vu. It's like, whoa, we did this again. I remember when I was a little kid, we... We did this whole dry land thing. They walked across. And then you know what God told them to do? Do you remember that? He said, go take 12 stones out of that river. And I want you to set up a memorial. To what? How incredibly brave they are? No, to how incredibly awesome God is. He says, I want you to make a memorial. I want you to be reminded again and again and again of how faithful and how strong and how gracious I am. I I love the fact that God oftentimes would announce himself and he would present a challenge that required courage from his children this way. He would say this to them. A lot of, look in the Old Testament. You see this over and over again. He says, I am the Lord your God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you look at how many times that phrase appears in Scripture, you're going to be blown away in the Old Testament. Why does he keep doing that? Why does he constantly do that to them? 
Why does he always announce himself? I'm the Lord your God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Hi, I'm the Lord your God, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Oh, hi, let me introduce myself. I'm the Lord your God, the God of Abraham, Isaac. Why does he keep doing that over and over again? He wanted them to remember. He wanted them to be reminded. He wanted them to stop, and, and he wanted his children to be compelled to remember his love and his provision, to remember how incredibly powerful and the deliverance that he provided. He wanted them to remember the promises that he made and faithfully kept. Can I share with you one of the most incredible promises God has ever made to his kids? And if you're here this morning and you know Christ is your Savior, you're a child of God, he's your Heavenly Father, I want you to just listen to this verse for a second. No matter what you're facing, no matter what's stressing you out right now, listen to this. God says to you, I will not in any way fail you or give you up or leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless or forsake you. I will not let you down, and I love this part, or ever relax my hold on you. Most assuredly not. If there was a shadow of doubt, he says, most assuredly not. God never goes, whoops, and drops you. Doesn't happen. Here's the truth that perhaps you need to be reminded of this morning more than anything else. God has faithfully walked you through troubles and trials before. Okay, newsflash. God has faithfully walked you through troubles and trials before. The fact that you're here this morning means that you're a billboard of God's grace and mercy and strength and promises fulfilled. You may be kind of a worn out billboard, but you're a billboard of God's grace and mercy. You need to be reminded of that. I love the music that God has just given to us down through the ages. God's used so many gifted songwriters to encourage our hearts and, and challenge us. And probably one of the most famous Christian songs is the song Amazing Grace. Can I remind you of the third stanza real quick, if you don't mind? Through. Through many dangers. Toils and snares. Not around, not under, not over, not avoiding. Through. Through many dangers, toils and snares, I have already come. His grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. I want you to, uh, I'm going to ask you to think about something for just a moment, if you would. Let me ask you, how many times has God disappointed you? How many times have you known him to not provide you just what you needed at just the right time? How many nights have you gone to bed hungry? How many mornings have you woken up freezing with no clothes to wear? I want you to listen to the words of an aging David as he would pause and reflect back over his lifetime. He writes this. He says, I've been young, and now I am old. Yet I've not seen the righteous abandoned or his children begging for bread. While we have to face our giants in order to defeat them, you need to take the first step with the first stone. Grab onto the past. Not that past that the devil wants to remind you of. Not that past that Satan wants to say, hey, you know, you screwed up again. That past that God wants you to be reminded of. And it has little to do with you and everything to do with him. What he's done. The victories he's won. We have to confront our struggles with the memory of God's incredible track record etched decisively in our hearts. I want to say that again. I want you to just let that sink in for a moment. You have to confront your struggles with the memory of God's incredible track record etched decisively on your heart. He has not lost. He has not lost a battle. He has not lost a child. He will not lose. And we say we believe in God, but I wonder about the God we say we believe in. Because sometimes we're like, yeah, I believe in God. 
what God, what version of God do you believe in? Because I want you to know this morning as you stand stressed out or sit stressed out and freaked out and, 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 and don't know what's going to happen and how this problem is going to be solved or how that giant's going to go down or how we're going to face that bill, that disease, that issue tomorrow. I want you to know God has not ever been defeated. You're his child. And he says he will not leave you or forsake you nor give you up and he will never relax his hold on you. Which God, which version of God do you believe in? Because Satan wants to give you a version that's really watered down. He wants to give you the God that says, well, God only helps those who help themselves. And if you're not helping yourself well enough, God's not really going to help you at all. Really? It seems to me God initiated everything and just asked me to respond. I, I reference my, uh, my grandfather on my mom's side often. He was a tremendous <coughs> tremendous influence in my life. And he was, a, he was a wonderful pastor. He was an even better grandfather. But he was also a recovered alcoholic. And more importantly, a sinner saved by God's grace. And one of his favorite songs was victory in Jesus. It's amazing, once you go through stuff, how compelling lyrics become. Because this is a song filled with a lot of truth and a lot of hope. It's a song that reminds us of God's ability to bring victory. And I remember, he, my grandfather couldn't sing real well. He couldn't really carry a tune in a bucket. But the good news is, the Bible never says you have to sing well. It just says you have to make a joyful noise. And I'm glad about that because I, 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 I got some things from him, and that's one of those things. But I just remember, I think in the book that we used to sing out of, there was like three verses to that song. I don't know if there's another version. And I remember the first verse would start, and he would sing, and you'd start to hear him sing a little bit. But when the second verse began, he kind of drowned everybody else out. Let me remind you what it says. It says, I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and he caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Will you do this with me? That's weird, I know, but I'm weird. Page 470. In your red book, would you sing that chorus if you know it? If you don't know it, just make a joyful noise, right? <laughs> would you do that this morning? Now, 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 here's the thing, though. I don't want you to just sing notes on a page. I want you to sing words from your heart. Because there's truth in these words, and I want to send you out of this huddle this morning, understanding that you are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. I want you to understand that. No matter what Satan tries to persuade you of later today, or maybe he's trying to persuade you of this moment, how you're going to be defeated and you'll never measure up and you'll never be enough and you'll never get through and God will never bring you through that trouble or over that difficulty. I want you to remember these words this week. Are you ready? Somebody give us a note because you don't want me doing that. There we go. Oh, victory in Jesus my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with His redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew Him and all my love is due Him. He plunged me guys saying that like you actually meant that. I want you to know this morning you can have victory, but first you have to pick up the stone of the past. This morning before we go, I just want you to know for sure what God's love compelled him to do for you nearly 2,000 years ago. The first part 
of John 3.16 reveals to us God's heart and tells us what he did. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And he didn't just give his son to come into the world. He gave his son to come into the world to be a sacrifice, to die a cruel death on a cross for you, for me, for us. The second part of John 3.16 reveals to us our choice and the benefits that come from this choice. That whoever believes in him, and, and we got to clarify that. We need to make sure we nail that down and we understand what believes in him means. It doesn't mean, yeah, I believe he existed. That's not what that word means. That word means rested your weight fully upon and all of your hope in him. Whoever rested their weight fully upon and hope entirely on him shall not perish. That word perish doesn't mean just die physically. It means go out of existence with relationship to Jesus Christ and to God as far as separation goes. You will no longer exist in the presence of God ever if you perish without placing your belief squarely and firmly, securely on Christ. Whoever believes in him shall not perish. Great words in scripture, but, but have eternal life. Isn't that simple? Like if you just pick out the highlighted words, you've got the gospel. God loved, he gave, you believe, you live. That's it. That's all there is. So maybe you're here this morning and, and maybe you're like, well, I try to think back of my past and, and I have a difficult time seeing God's strength and his grace and his presence in my life in the past. I don't see the victories that God won for me. If you have difficulty looking back in your past to see God's strength and his mercy and his grace revealed, let me ask you to look back a little bit further to about 2,000 years ago on a, on, a, on a cross outside of the city of Jerusalem where God hung with his arms open wide as he showed and showered all of the love he could muster on you to take care of your sin. Maybe you just need to look back there and realize, you know what, no matter what my circumstance, the cross tells me God loves me and he's for me. Let me share with you. He did this to open a way for you to have eternal life, to have abundant life. Let me share with you what he didn't do. He didn't do this so that you would have a problem-free life. Sometimes we get that mixed up. I think, well, I trusted God, and why aren't my problems all gone? Because you live in a sin-soaked world, and there's not a whole lot you can do about it except pray, be faithful, and trust that God's going to come back, and he's going to restore all things new. He's going to make all things new again. He will. He promises. And there again, his track record's perfect. He's going to fulfill what he's promised. So he hasn't promised you a, a problem-free life, but he's promised you a life filled with his presence and full with his purpose. That's awesome. That you have, when you accept Christ, you have God's eternal presence within you through his Holy Spirit, and you now have a purpose that he has saved you for. He didn't save you just to get you out of hell. He saved you to do something with the salvation you've been given. Serve, grow, touch other lives. Maybe you're here this morning and you've already placed your faith in Christ and, and what he did for you on the cross. And maybe that's already done. You've checked that one off the list and said, yeah, God, I've already placed my faith in you. And I, I believe what Jesus did for me on the cross, but you know what? My life is just filled with giants lately. Maybe, maybe more than anything this morning, you need to pick up the stone of the past and just be reminded of, of what God's done for you before. Look back, think back, be reminded. Maybe you need to be reminded of the big giants that Jesus has already defeated for you because he loves you. He's defeated sin for you. That thing that will separate you eternally from God, he's defeated that for you. By the way, because he loves you, he took care of death. That's no longer the final, it doesn't have the final say. And the grave is no longer your final stop. Jesus is taking care of that for you. Maybe you just need to let your father's words wash over you once again. And I'm going to ask you to do something here this morning as we get ready to close. I want you to just close your eyes for a moment. And as best as you can, try to tune everyone and everything else out for just, for just a moment. And I want you to just listen intently as almighty God, creator and the sustainer of the universe the great I am, your heavenly father. I want you to listen as your father speaks this to your heart because you are his loved 
child. He says, I will never fail you. I will never give you up. I will never leave you without support. I will not. I will not. I will not in any degree leave you helpless nor forsake you. I will not let you down or ever relax my hold on you. And if you doubt that, I want you to know most assuredly not. With eyes still closed, Father, we just thank you for your promises. We thank you that you've been there all the time. And, and sometimes all we need to do for a moment is remember. To look back at our past and see the triumphs you've brought about in our life. And the battles that you've fought on our behalf. And the overwhelming victory you promised to all of those who've placed their faith in your son. Father, when we're... a uh, faced with giants in our lives, cause us to pause for a moment and, and remember your promises, remember your track record, and be reminded of your faithfulness. God, let us lean on your strength in our weaknesses and let us trust your grace in our struggles. God, let us seek your purposes in the midst of our problems. Lord, we love you and, and, and we know that you love us. But help us move that knowledge from our heads to our hearts. Help us live in your love. And then, God, help us live out your love through just radical trust and unflinching obedience. God, you didn't save us to be cowards. You saved us to be courageous. Make us courageous. In the face of our giants, in the face of our stress, in the face of our struggles and difficulties, remind us of who you are and whose we are. God, we love you and we thank you that victory is secured and it's guaranteed through your son, Jesus. And in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being here this morning. Pray God blesses your afternoon. Any announcements before we go? Guests, visitors, thanks for being with us this morning. Have a good afternoon.